looking forward to uh, listening to, uh, I guess, the Samsung journey uh, with Bixby. Uh, I presume yes. that's what we're going to be talking about. Exactly, especially think, uh, speech, speech recognition. Right. That's right. what I'll cover today. Yes. Yeah, wonderful. And um, we've got a couple of, um, so, you know, the, the way we are running uh, Sabud, um, you know, we've evolved that over the last uh, five months, like most people have had to evolve everything over the last five months with the coronavirus. But we've uh, gone online uh, with all our content. And we have uh, also um, uh, changed our way of teaching in the sense that we have defined a set of um, passion projects. Uh, these are mostly to do with some social impact, uh, but also other just technology kind of projects that are interesting for the students to pick early on so that we can uh, craft their journey um, you know, through the content and uh, machine learning and deep learning so that they can specialize in speech or in uh, image analysis or NLP. And uh, we've just uh, had uh, a colleague join us who used to work at uh, ISI Kolkata for uh, I think the last five years or so, who's done a lot of work in speech. And so I was just telling the folks that uh, out of the passion projects, uh, they've got a good opportunity to work in speech and uh, hone their Wonderful. skills. And I think uh, your talk is going to um, really inspire them. Uh, so uh, it's great. It's, it's just um, well timed. Um, we'll just give a couple of minutes for uh, other folks to join. Sure, sure. Um, as I mentioned to you, uh, we are uh, streaming live on YouTube. Um, um, and the lucky ones get to come onto Zoom and uh, actually interact with you at the end of your, your talk as well. Uh, we will be taking questions uh, from the YouTube uh, streaming as well and asking those uh, at the end of your talk. Uh, okay. Look forward to giving those uh, responses to them. Sure. Um, So we, uh, we do have a mix of uh, students here who are uh, from Sabud. Uh, and as I think I was mentioning to you, uh, we've been very lucky to have students now joining us from uh, Canada and Germany and uh, Nigeria, uh, amongst other countries, New Zealand. Um, and uh, we took on our batch of 65 students this time, rather than the usual 35 that you know that we were taking on. Uh, just because uh, physical uh, constraints don't exist anymore. <laughs> So, so it's enabled us to actually get these uh, students. Yeah, that's one of the good things, right, about COVID, that suddenly the virtual world has become very active. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I call yes. that the COVID positive, right? <laughs> so, um, you know, we've obviously at Tatras also grown our team. So uh, what we've done with this group is that uh, every three or, you know, uh, three students from Sabud have been paired with one of the data scientists in, Sabud, uh, in uh, Tatras. And so they are like their personal tutor. Uh, which was a um, you know process that I had learned while I was at Warwick of uh, you know making sure that uh, students remain motivated because one of the big downsides that uh, you know places like Coursera and edX are facing right now is the fact that uh, there isn't a safety net and so they have thousands of students which is fantastic uh, but a lot of them then end up end up not completing the courses so um, you know we feel that the safety net is really important and it keeps up the morale of the students too. So, uh, and they get, of course, to interact with uh, data scientists working on real world projects, right? So, uh, you know, we, we don't have the same level of scale as uh, MOOCs would have, and we don't have any intention of having that. But um, uh, hopefully, you know, we'll, we'll have a good set of motivated students that uh, graduate from here. Wonderful. Really okay. Wonderful. So, uh, you know, I guess, um, uh, do you want to just check that uh, you're able to share your screen? And yes, yes. I'll start uh, sharing. Just uh, uh -huh. give me a minute. Uh, wait a minute. Can you, are you able to see this? Yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. We are. Okay, that's great. Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay. So, uh, good morning, everyone. Can I go ahead? Yes, please do. So, okay, uh, great. So today I'm going to talk to you about uh, something that's very dear to my heart, and this is about speech. You know, I'm going to talk to you about the fascinating world of uh, speech recognition, and. Uh, Having lived this journey, you know, over the last uh, several years, I'm going to talk about uh, both the exciting things and also the challenges we face on a day-to-day -day basis. And I'm also going to talk about uh, Bixby, which is our voice assistant. Uh, 
in Samsung, and we also have a Bixby Vision. So it's basically an AI based system, but uh, both voice and vision are there. Today I'm going to talk about Bixby Voice only. So uh, you know, if you see the trend, right? So intelligent assistants are fast emerging as the next breakthrough, right? So if you see 1990s, that was the era of the web, where you know it's the old-fashioned, old-fashioned days, right? Then the mobile phones came along, and that was the era of the apps. But it is fast transforming now. And um, you know the, the new world, and it's all happening very quickly. So you have cars, you have refrigerators, you have smart speakers. Everything has voice embedded in them. And more and more, it's becoming the reality because the devices don't have any touch points, right? There's no way you can touch. The only way you can do is speak. And very soon, you know, we are seeing all kinds of IoT devices also being being voice enabled. And particularly as the technology is evolving. Uh, it's making it possible for this voice uh, to be ubiquitous, right? Pretty much they're there everywhere. So that's what I'm going to talk about. What makes this happen? Because voice recognition is a fundamental part of this, right? So I'm going to talk about that today. So we have launched our assistant uh, called Bixby. And uh, we launched it in 2017 uh, with the S8 Plus. And uh, now we have around 50 million users. And uh, with the whole, all it's available on pretty much all of the Samsung devices. And our vision is that this will be the most, it will be the intelligent interface for Bixby. It's already happening, right? But we want to make it more and more intelligent. And by end of this year, already we can see it happen. And we have one platform that can connect many devices in many, provide many services in many languages. And we are building this Bixby ecosystem. We have launched our, um, you know, store, the Bixby um, basically experience store where people can go in and they can, content providers, service providers can create their capsules. And we have already have so many capsules already available, right? And we have Bixby across so many devices. And the goal of Bixby is really to free users from what um, users, um, you know, it's a mundane task, right? To free users and focus people's attention on what, what matters most. So Bixby kind of launched my interaction. And over time, it becomes more intelligent, more helpful. So that is the goal of Bixby. And we already have, um, you know, as I mentioned to you, launched in several languages. We, we have German, we have French, we have Italian, we have various dialects of English. So I take care of English. So both support Indian English, US English, you know, UK based English and so on and so on. So there's a variety of languages. And uh, so that's what I'm gonna talk more about what, what powers this uh, technology, right? What powers this Bixby system? So today I'm going to focus more on speech and why is speech so difficult, right? Uh, it's because of the very nature of speech, right? It's uh, every speaker speaks differently. And there is some people can speak fast, some people speak slow, there's various accents and so on. There's a large vocabulary. Uh, so there's so many dialects. If you look at in English, for example, the way, you know, people in the North would speak English very different from the people in South will speak. Every state, you know, people add some variation, right? The way people speak English, there'll be local languages. People do code mixing as well. So a lot of times people will speak English mixed with Hindi or English mixed with Punjabi or something, right? So there are those kind of issues as well. So basically it's, uh, it's quite uh, challenging to deal with all this. And there's also personal data in there. So you may speak something and you may speak like a contact's name and the contact name may be in a local dialect, right? Uh, and that's your personal data, so all your contacts. And how do we recognize that? You know, it's difficult. And then on top of that, you can have background noise. You can have various kinds of disturbances that happen, right? As are happening now, you can see you hear a plane coming, right? You can, you know, in a noisy environment, you have kids playing, you have dogs barking, all those things happen. And there is near field and far field. So it's not just when you're talking to a mobile, it's a near field, but you may have to be talking to a speaker or a refrigerator from a distance, that's far field. That is happening as well, as well as, uh, you know, you can have regular conversation happening or music playing, and then you may you may want to invoke speech, right? So you need to detect keywords. Like when you say, hi, Bixby, that's a keyword that we detect. So there's been a lot of advancements in speech, but despite all that, at the industry level, right, the commercial world, the sentence error rate. So we measure speech error accuracy by word error rate and sentence error rate. The sentence error rate accuracies are still, you know, 75 to 80% at best, right? 
So, so it's, you know, that's the current issue. And even though we are using a lot of deep learning today, I'm going to explain you what we're doing, how we do it. And, but still, you know, there's a room to go, right? So uh, as I mentioned, so we've launched Bixby in several languages and for Bixby to work in this multi-device environment, there are many issues to be solved. Even wake up is an issue. So when you say, hi Bixby, for example, you know, you don't want all the devices to wake up, right? You want the right device, which is probably near to you or which makes sense at that time, probably the device with, with which you're working to, to wake up. So there's a lot of technology that goes around uh, understanding, you know, what to do in various situations. And uh, each of these devices adds some complexity because each of the devices had different microphones, different characteristics. I'm gonna talk about that. So uh, speech today is, you know, a typical speech processing system is not just speech recognition. I mean, of course, ASR, autom uh, automatic speech recognition is fundamental, but there are a lot of other surrounding technologies uh, which I'm gonna talk about. So, uh, you know, for example, somebody says, hi, Bixby, send a bouquet to John at 7 a.m. That was a speech, right? But there is uh, pre-processing, first of all. So some, you know, we have to remove the echo, we have to noise, cancel the noise. So there's some pre-processing involved. Then there is big high wake up. So when we say high big speed, that is a wake up, right? So we have to wake up. The reason is we don't want, we cannot have, uh, you know, listen to speech all the time. It will drain battery. There's privacy issues. So that's why most, are, most uh, assistants today are in the mode when, you know, when you want them, you, you have to invoke them some wake up word, right? Although that may be changing soon, but that's today's situation. So the wake up kind of detects high BXB and activates the rest of the system. And I'll explain how this wake up, you know, works. Then there is a speech recognition. So this kind of sense says, transcribes it to send bouquet to John at 7 a.m. Now notice that John spelled here is J-O-N, whereas the John, which I intended is J-O-H-N, right? And notice that I say 7 a.m. here, and here it is 7 colon 00 a.m., right? So typical ASR will not need no know, know these nuances. So it'll just come up with something like this, right? So therefore, we need uh, something that can disambiguate John, J O N versus J O H N. Figure out the J O H N is in my contacts, and J O H N is the contact that I usually call. I may be having J O N as well, but I have to figure out, you know. From, from data, past data and usage, the JOHN is the one I refer to most of the time. Therefore, I have to substitute that. So they have to distinguish and disambiguate. So PDSS is basically a personal data subsystem. In most ASR systems, there is a fundamental part of that. I have to have that and I have to incorporate in the, in the system itself, right? And then I have something called an inverse text normalization, which kind of converts this 7 a.m. to the 7 colon 00 a.m. And then I also have endpoint detection, which kind of detects that I have finished speaking because I don't want to uh, cut off early. So I need to detect the endpoint at the right time because if I don't detect at the right time, it can lead to, number one, it can lead to accuracy issues. So if, it, if I cut the sentence off early, you know, and it can lead, and also if I don't um, uh, cut off early enough, it can lead to noise and it can lead to all other kinds of issues. And also I can end up wasting, you know, system resources. There's all these issues that happen. So the endpoint detection, the elements, of course, I didn't mention start point detection. There's also start point detection. So all of those things are fundamental part of um, of the system, right? So uh, let me explain. Uh, so basically, the speech uh, processing system has a signal pre-processing component and a speech modeling component and a post-processing component. Today, I hope to give you a flavor of you know all these things. I really cannot go into too much into depth, and I also cannot talk about the proprietary technologies that we have, but I can give you the state of the art, uh, what's happening in the research and um, just give you sort of an introduction. So uh, typically the conventional ASR, you know, is like this. So there is, a, you know, they've been there for a while and uh, this is how a typical conventional ASR looks like. So it's a combination of things. So there is, as I mentioned, there is speech that comes and that gets, uh, there is some pre-processing that happens. There's also personal data that kind of goes into the system and that helps the language model, improve the language model accuracy. So as I mentioned, the JON versus JOH and that kind of thing will come in here. So typically, you know, what happens is there is a audio that then there is a feature extraction that happens and a recorded utterance. So a re utterance sort of gets recorded or you can say it's like streamed, right? So that utterance is kind of offered and sent to the server. 
most of the processing usually happens on the server today, and it's now changing. I'll also talk about on-device systems where this processing is happening on the device, and I'll explain how. So recorded utterance is represented as a sequence of feature vectors. And this uh, acoustic model, you know, uses, typically it was using Gaussian mixture models. And now with the advent of deep learning, uh, there's a lot of deep learning being used. So LSDMs are being used a lot here. So this acoustic model kind of uh, links the acoustic to the word of phoneme sequence. So it basically computes the likelihood right, of, uh, uh, you know, of uh, basically a set of, of, of phonemes, given that, given the utterance, what is the likelihood of a certain set of phonemes, right? So give estimates likelihood of an acoustic sequence given a word or a phoneme. It does that, and then this acoustic model by itself is not enough. We need a lexicon, which is basically nothing but a dictionary, right? It's a kind of dictionary. And this lexicon typically uses, um, uh, you know, an HMM, right? And, uh, it basically gives, gives the kind of uh, system understanding about what phonemes can follow what other phoneme, right? So what phones can follow, phonemes can follow each other phonemes. And then, a, and then there's a language model, which is basically, uh, you know, can use an n-gram and nothing, but it's just basically gives a probability of word given the preceding words. So it's kind of used to model the probability of occurrence of a word based on the n minus one previous words, right? And uh, then there is also a decoder. So basically the whole thing, so, you know, there's an acoustic model, there's a lexicon and language model, and all, all these things kind of, you know, kind of work together with the decoder. So the decoder uses something like a Viterbi algorithm or some kind of a dynamic programming approach to find the best word sequence. So it kind of, you know, tries to figure out the best, most probable um, sequence of, um, you know, words that would match the, the input uh, audio, right? And, and then of course, I have not shown the post-processing here, but I mean, post-processing and all those things are like ITN, it's a fundamental part. So ITNs can uh, can do two things. One is they can enhance the readability of text, as I explained, so 7 AM, you know, 7 colon 00 AM. It can also help correct ASI errors. So sometimes ITNs can understand uh, the domain, the context, and they can help uh, sort of improve accuracy to some extent. They can also understand uh, named entities, uh, you know, and they sometimes, you know, we also have named named entity could be like a song name or a movie title. And uh, ITNs can also uh, understand the user's personal data. So personal data is used in the language model as well as can be used in the ITN. Uh, so it's all, you know, information about users, file, file names or their contact name and so on. The whole system works and it kind of takes a lot of data to tune this. Typically, to make any production quality, you know, speech recognition system, it would take minimum 10,000 hours of uh, audio, right? The 10,000 hours of high quality audio is not, a, not an easy thing to do. You know, it takes a lot of effort to record this audio in different conditions, noisy environments, different dialects, you know, so different types of speakers, male, female, different age groups. So it takes a lot of time to, to make this kind of, you know, audio. And uh, it takes a lot of effort to train this data. And that's the reason why, you know, despite the progresses, if you can see the progress, the conventional ASR growth, right? The errors, the, the error rate has kind of dropped. And this is, this is the word error rate. This is not the sentence error rate. The word error rate, I agree, has improved a lot over the years. If you can see earlier, you know, the uh, uh, GMMs were used and then this, it got switched into, uh, you know, DNN and a lot of DNNs was being used and LSDM came up and, and so, you can see this is the we kind of beat the machine uh, in 2017 or so, but by no, by no means it's enough because the it shows the this is on a specific uh, set of tests, but in the real world, you know, there's still a lot of error that happens, and as I as I mentioned, there's still uh, room to go. So what are the challenges today? So you know the basic challenges are like this. So in uh, in acoustic modeling. It is, as I mentioned, there's a huge amount of data and this data has to be labeled. So while there are techniques today to you know, use unsupervised learning and learn from a lot of unlabeled data, I won't get into those today, but uh, there are a lot of techniques there, but traditionally there has been a label of data. So we have to label the data and that's very expensive. And uh, it's, you know, that is one. And then we need a near field data as well as far field data. And there is a lot of uh, robustness to variations and pre-processing because there could be different um, you know, kinds of speakers, 
uh, I mean, speaker, speaker, um, speakers in, in a refrigerator and speaker in a TV could be different. You can have, uh, you know, various kinds of issues. So I'll explain that later. How, what is the issue? That is one, and the language modeling also typically needs a lot of vocabulary. So there is a huge um, vocabulary uh, that, that's needed because we have to typically model all the sentences in English language, and it, it's, not, it's not so easy. So it takes a lot of data there as well. And then there's decoder. So decoder, the challenge is the latency, right? Because you have to do multi-pass rescoring without the latency impact. And also you may have more than one language model. So for example, you may have a language model just for um, videos, right? Uh, or entertainment area. You may have a language model for the medical domain. So depending on the situation, we also may need to load the light, light language model in the right time. That also requires some uh, sophisticated techniques to be able to in runtime load the right, right language model. And then again, you know, uh, there is a context, as I mentioned. So figuring out the domain specific LM, for example, you know, we need to understand the context. Sometimes we don't have the context. And, uh, you know, users may switch from domain to domain. So today they try, suddenly talk about music and suddenly they may say, okay, open the door. So there could be different uh, contexts that can happen uh, very, very quickly. And then of course, the geographical expansion. So there is so many accents and uh, we, we require, you know, uh, pretty much, we may, we may need almost from scratch development because new language, especially we don't have any data. So, uh, so all these complexities are there in ASR. So, you know, I, I, I cannot explain exactly everything, but what I can tell you is that um, it's a very exciting area and uh, a lot of progress has been there. And, you know, especially far field, there is a lot of progress that has happened. Uh, simulating the home and office environments is not easy. So we have been doing that as well, as well as uh, multilingual is another area where, you know, you make people, people do code mixing, they switch from one language to another, or they, they, they talk multiple languages in the same sentence. And the other thing that's happening is that, uh, that there's also uh, multi, uh, multi-modal aspects coming in. So even in like new, like robots or things which have a camera, you may have a, you know, multi-modal, you may have a lip uh, audio, you know, you may be able to look at the speaker's face and do some lip syncing kind of thing. So new techniques are coming up, uh, especially in the, next, in the future, you know, you have robots walking around, you may, you may do that as well. So it's a very exciting area. And there's a lot of research in this area happening, right? And as I mentioned, there's semi-supervised uh, uh, approaches and unsupervised approaches as well, because there's a ton of data and how do we take all this data and kind of learn from it? So I'll talk about a new wave in, uh, in speech recognition, which is end-to-end -end ASR. So last uh, three, four years, you know, have been very active, a huge amount of research happening. And what's, what's happening is that, uh, the end-to-end -end ASR has come up, wherein we do not have, you know, in a conventional ASR, we have an acoustic model, a lexicon, language model, et cetera, decoder. We don't have that. In an end-to-end -end ASR, we're just learning from sequence to sequence. So we are looking at, uh, you know, just speech data and it's labeled data, but instead of, you know, all this, we have a, just, a, we have a single model that can learn everything, right? So we have a technique such as listen, attend, spell, which came from Google, and then there's also RNN and transducer approach. So there's been a ton of a ton of uh, you know research happening in this area, and it's a hotbed of you know really, really you know a lot of activity. And there is uh, typical traditional approaches such as the CTC approach, as well as uh, there is that has evolved into the RNN and transducer approach, as well as there is a listen attend spell, which is like an attention based uh, you know encoder decoder model, right? And there are, I'll explain all the challenges that have that are there because of this. So the, the benefits of this, so what is the main benefit of end-to-end -end ASR? One is that it can reduce the model size significantly because notice here, there is no language model. So language models are very heavy. So uh, this end-to-end -end ASR, we have found that it can reduce up to even 18 times, right? Um, and the size, you know, dramatically reducing up to 18 times. So that means it can fit into devices. So earlier this ASR would run in the server. Now with this end-to-end -end ASR, it can actually run on device, which is really big benefit. The other thing is it can help uh, recognize open domains, so open vocabulary, because there is no language model. So really you don't have anything that is out of vocabulary. So it's whatever you train, it learns, and it kind of learns very well. And it's able to uh, kind of, you know, extend its learning. So, so that it can, it can, there is no kind of, it can adapt the learning and there is no 
kind of you know out of vocabulary. So it's very helpful for recognizing open domain. Uh, and of course, we are looking at other things, techniques such as you know um, language model as well. So I'll explain some of those things. So how we can fuse language models and how we can do some contextual listener and spell. So I, I'll explain that a little later. But basically, the benefits are the vocabulary independence. So it's very ideal for open, open vocabulary, so dictation kind of things, where there is no domain, but they're just talking anything. It can really help, and it can help in reducing the ROM. So as I mentioned, there's a single neural network, and we can apply a lot of network compression techniques. So it's really good for on device, and it is simpler to build. So it is easier because here there are one system, you don't have like multiple systems, and, and so on. And there is no lexicon, for example, and so on. So it's very useful uh, in that respect. Um, but uh, what are the challenges? So the one challenge is the streaming because in a typical SR, you when you're speaking, right? As you speak, it kind of decodes and kind of shows it. Here, because of the context required and because there is no language model and so on, so there, it requires full context. Um, because of that, when you're streaming, right? You may not see the output until you finish speaking. That can be really uh, bad for users because users don't get the perception that the um, system is listening, right? So there have been some attempts there. So there is something called MOCA, monotonic chunkwise attention. And also RNN transducers have helped there. Uh, so this is uh, some techniques are there so sort of to overcome this approach, I mean, uh, this limitation. And the other is the training data. So as I mentioned, typical conventional ASR needs around 10,000 hours of data. This requires a lot more. So the training data needs to be there and has to be transcribed. And so, and because in conventional system, you know, have language models. These language models are trained on billions of words. There is already existing corpus, you know, data that is there in language models. Here, there is no language model. So everything has to be in the transcribed audio data. So it means that there's a lot more, um, you know, effort needed to, to do this data. And here is where the unconventional techniques of, you know, learning from unlabeled data we have to use. And then uh, there could be some spelling mistakes because there could be some less frequently seen proper nouns. For example, I mentioned medical domain or some specific, you know, very critical key domains like music domain. It won't have all the data with it. So it can make errors. So that's where auxiliary techniques where you can have a language model or an auxiliary language model and fuse it have come into place. And there are different types of fusion, you know, there's early fusion, late fusion, different types of fusion techniques are there where you can actually fuse a language model. And also, the, I mentioned the PDSS data earlier, right? There is no PDSS here, so we have to find a way to bring that context. So there's, you know, techniques to, uh, such as contextual listen attend spell, which kind of are getting um, popular and taking all the personal data and sort of bringing it in. And that is the other things. So there are uh, all these techniques in place, and uh, it's very interesting because we are seeing, we're actually implementing and seeing uh, how it works and. Um, you know, we have succeeded and some of our competitors also succeeded in actually making it work and, and making it production quality. So uh, I think uh, this has been a very exciting journey for us. So next I'll talk a little more about uh, some things earlier. So I talked about personal data models. So as I mentioned to you, you know, you can have contacts, you can have music titles, names and so on. So how this kind of personal data is kind of takes in and then it is used uh, during decoding and using IDN. So it can it can help there. So it can, you, can, you know, it can sort of boost the probability in the language model. And even in the case of end-to-end uh, -end SR, it can be used. Also, it can be resolved in your home, home just like John or Devachan join. Same thing as Sandeep, right, in Indian context. You may have Sandeep spelled as S-A-N-D-E-P or you may have spelled as S-A-N-D-I-P. So what, what does the user intend, right? So the personal data modeling is up there. And the on-device ASR, as I mentioned to you, is something which is uh, you know evolving and end-to-end uh, -end ASR is very, makes it very suitable. And there, you know, we are, the challenge is that uh, there is no uh, server, right? So everything has to happen on the device. And uh, there are, of course, latency advantages, there's privacy advantages. And, and so on. But the uh, main thing is that there's a lot of data and the, the model has to be compressed. And while end-to-end -end techniques can certainly help, if you are fusing language models, then it may not work very well. So there is a, there are hybrid architectures also coming up where you have an on-device ASR that may decode. And then if that works fine, that's fine. Okay, if that doesn't work fine, that runs goes to the server. A lot of those kind of techniques are coming up. And um, 
uh, it's a it's a area of uh, you know research and a lot of uh, people are working on this on device asr because really it's a practical problem right you 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 really want you cannot afford if you're driving in a car and you know you want something you want it right then you don't want to wait for server you may have a poor connectivity right so how do you do that and uh, also we uh, there is a um, chance for personalization so you can actually asr can be more customized to the users to the, to the speakers speaking right so there is a there is a chance for personalization and some of those things we are working there as well and basically speaker adaptation uh, you know is also one area so that is one thing so there is a lot of exciting work here and the other area that uh, we are working on is the whisper asr wherein the asr kind of can can learn to understand you know whisper so you can whisper back to the asr and uh, whisper to asr and asr can whisper back to you and so there are different techniques of uh, this you know whisper asr and uh, their challenges because of when user is whispering right the data is very different so the spectral difference between the whispered speech and a normal speech is very high so you can see you know the, the whispered speech versus normal is a huge difference and because of that uh, typically you know uh, if you put a regular asr system and put whisper in there it won't work so the different approaches one is that you can detect whether the user is uh, speaking uh, having a whispered uh, you know Uh, and then you can have a separate asr model that is one approach the other approach is in the regular asr we have to train it along with the whispered data uh, so that's another so there are different approaches here and uh, uh, we are we are working on to seeing which one because there could be various situations where you know spring to the phone may be better um, because you know you may be in a meeting room or something or you may have baby sleeping so you don't want to speak uh, loudly Okay, so next I'll talk about a little bit of pre-processing. So as I mentioned in the beginning, the pre-processing is a fundamental part of uh, the ASR, and uh, the pre-processing kind of conditions the signal so that the wake-up in ASR can deal better. So why is it important? Is because because of the noisy conditions and because of the variation in the speaker. So you may have different number of speaker, different number of microphones. So you have eight eight in a speaker versus two in a vacuum cleaner. you have high echo for example in a tv you have tv noise as well right and uh, so you have high echo and you can have high ambient noise in a home environment and and there, there could be far field conditions so because of all this and then there is limited uh, resources available so typically you know this pre processing has to work in a very uh, noisy uh, and everything has to be on device pre processing cannot happen pre processing is all happening on the device so there are challenges of you know um, low mips there and few ram so all these challenges are there in pre processing so pre processing is very important because if we don't do pre processing right the asr will simply not work right and uh, so do this so there are so for, for this you know you have acoustic echo cancellation you have some kind of front end pre processing you have noise suppression and all these things are happening and there's deep learning used in each one so there is so much of deep learning being used in asr you know even as i mentioned you in detecting the domain um to figure out the, the even in end to end asr you need to detect the domain to figure out the language model right? there is deep learning being used there so pretty much deep learning is used very extensively and here also there is deep learning being used and there are other things which we do for some advanced areas where for example you may have eight speakers yeah, so eight microphones but we may want to channel all the microphones in a single direction there is neural beam forming techniques being used there is direction of arrival estimation wherein we if uh, let's say uh, you know you have far field and you want to detect which direction the speaker is in right for example in a in a robo case you have a robo and robo is listening robo needs to understand who spoke right we need to understand uh, the direction of arrival estimation all those things you know require some kind of you know techniques advanced techniques to to do pre processing so there is acoustic echo, echo cancellation there is noise suppression there is beam forming these are all basic things that are there a lot of research is uh, there published literature is there in this area and this is a uh, very important for uh, the system uh, next i'll talk about wake up so you know wake up is also very important because if the system doesn't wake up is very irritating and also if the system wakes up too often or wakes up when the system the user doesn't intend that's and also it's irritating and also it's a invasion of privacy you don't want the system to to listen to you when you don't intend so there are challenges you know false alarms so as i mentioned the privacy concerns you can have recognition failures because of ambient noise so there could be those things 
there could be pronunciation issues because of which you have recognition error. You can have far field because of which we are speaking at a distance, it doesn't work, and so on. And then, of course, it has to be low power, low footprint, and all that, right? So typically, the wake up, how it works, there is a some there, there is a some kind of pre-processing and there is a keyword spotter. So the system is always listening. And this wake up is multi-stage wake up system. So typically the keyword spotter and the first level of wake up verification runs on the device. And the, the second level of wake up verification typically runs on the server. If this is, this is the, we have a full fledged you know, server-based as well. So the, the keyword spotter is very, uh, you know, very active. It listens to the, to the wake up and then immediately it figures out, okay, this makes sense. But keyword spotter may, may pass something. So when the, even the user doesn't intend, right? It may still pass it. Because the keyword spotter is designed to have a kind of low, sensitive, um, uh, low sensitivity. So it kind of just, just kind of grabs it, right? Then you, that's why you need a second and a third level of verification uh, to do this. So that's why you have these systems where people, where you have all, and this deep learning used everywhere. There is, you know, different types of approaches, even end-to-end -end approaches. So there is a, you know, that level of verification. So that's why, um, uh, you know, the typically the second, uh, second level of verification typically runs on the server because it can have a, it can be a larger model. So, so there is both precision and recall, um, you know, issues here, both need to be very good. Uh, and that's the reason why we need to do that. And there's a lot of, this is an, uh, this is an area where there's a lot of research again. And also there is an area where, you know, users can have their own big words. Instead of saying high speed, they, want, they may want to name their system something. And that is challenging uh, because the system has to be trained with that, and recognize that in every case. So there is search around, you know, user defined big words. Also, as I mentioned, the simultaneous wake up issues. So you have five devices, all of them will listen to you, which one should wake up. So there are, there are those, those environments as well. So, can you hear me? Yes, sir. I, yes, I can. Thank you. I think there was just some background uh, noise. Carry on, please. So, uh, so, so wake up, you know, has multi-stage wake up. So there is a always on low compute kind of wake up, which is a keyword spotter. And, uh, and then, as I mentioned, there's a small DNN there. And then there is a more accurate wake up. Um, so there's a two pass detection architecture and you can also have a three pass detection architecture. So this is a typical, you know, wake up uh, architecture and it's something which is very basic and it happens everywhere, right? And pretty much all assistants, voice assistants have this kind of a multi-stage wake up. And then in the beginning, I mentioned about the start point detection and end point detection. So both are important. So Endpoint detection is also extremely important because we need to detect when the, when the user is finished speaking, right? And uh, basically, if we, if we are late, then there are two problems. First, the user will perceive that the ASR is slow. So if you don't detect in time, user will think the ASR is slow. Second, ASR will make mistakes. Because you know, if you can have other background noise and all coming in, and then they could they could get introduced in the speed. If we if we detect too early, then also it's a problem because it will perceive the ASR is too good, right? It doesn't understand the user. All these issues are there, and uh, you can have uh, you know, when the user is speaking, you could have in cases where the user is speaking in a feeble way. There's background noise, and uh, all those things, right? So those so that is one thing, and second thing is the context. So you, when you are, let's say, booking a movie ticket or something, user may pause and repeat, right? Or when a book, user is thinking, right? You can have something where user pauses, but user hasn't really finished speaking. User is just pausing to think. So therefore, uh, we need to have contextual endpoint detection. So differentiating, you know, within sentence pauses and end of sentence pauses. So there's a lot of research around the contextual endpoint. And you know, all this is so important. Why? Because today we are so used to you know, typing, right? Typing and touching. But imagine a world where there is no touch at all. Everything happens in speech. Therefore, you know, all these techniques that I mentioned today are extremely important. And uh, to figure out, you know, detecting speech and on-speech segments, the background noise, and, and so on. So uh, wake up, uh, I mean, uh, uh, not wake up, sorry, endpoint detection, uh, combined with start point detection is fundamental technology. And a kind of, you know, uh, you have unified architectures that combine the ASR and the EP. 
So all of those things are, uh, are working. And uh, system, it kind of has to be intelligent enough to understand when the user has paused and when the user will continue. So we have uh, worked on different types of endpoint detection uh, techniques, again, using neural networks. So there are different techniques. Uh, and, and you know you have acoustic cues, for example, the user may say, hmm, or ah, uh, or something like that, right? And you can have differential rate of speaking. So for example, somebody may say, what is the weather? Or somebody may say, uh, what is the weather uh, in uh, New Delhi, right? And then somebody may say, okay, what is the weather in New Delhi uh, today? So it's like, you know, different acoustic features like pitch trend, duration, intensity, spectral con constancy, all of those things can be used uh, to differentiate, right? And not only acoustic features, but we have even the um, um, decoder, feature. decoder features are also can be used. So we can have decoder features and acoustic features together, and we can even have uh, some kind of NL features being used. So figuring out you know, which domain it is. For example, is it a weather domain? So once we understand it's a weather domain, once we understand it's a travel domain, we can be more you know, open. So there's a lot of research happening in this um, you know, endpoint detection as well as uh, you know, these techniques. And then uh, lastly, I'll talk about post-processing. I mentioned about the inverse text normalization. And I explained to you how it is important, for example, 6.30 a.m., 6.30 a.m., 15% the person should come here, you know, dollars, the dollar should come before 150 and, and so on, the right place. You know, when you're trying to calculate something, you say 3.14 multiplied by eight uh, into eight. So you need to understand how to, uh, you know, put three point, calculate 3.4 3 times eight. ASR has to produce this. So it is not so easy. Yes, it's not good if ASR just produced this. ASR has to produce something very And so we have to add punctuations and formatting. It could happen even in other cases like URLs, for example. And also it can help in correcting ASR errors. So for example, say, where is John Hopkins versus call John phone number? When you say, where is John's Hopkins? There is no apostrophe here. But when you say call John's phone number, there's an apostrophe here. Right? And for example, you say, how many carrots is the Kohinoor diamond versus add six carrots to my groceries? Carrots and carrots both sound similar, but they are different, right? So this is the kind of you know, basic uh, areas we work on. So I mentioned about uh, different research areas. So I, I won't go much into detail, uh, but we are working on end-to-end -end SR within which we are experimenting with CTC, the LAS, RNN transducers, et cetera. We're working on far field ASR. We were looking at uh, different kind of multi-channel speech recognition for multi-device multi -device experience. We're looking at neural beam formers. We're looking at whisper ASRs, um, on-device ASRs, especially applying the end to end ASR, but uh, kind of combining the system, a lot of speech processing and um, you know the post-processing all combined. And we're looking at contextual EPD, uh, definitely. So all of this uses a lot of deep learning if not deep learning, other techniques of um, learning. And it's a very complex system. And the challenge is it all has to happen in real time. It has to speak while the user is speaking. You don't have, it's not like there is no post-processing. I mean, there's no time for server to you know, come back. And the latency, typical latency we're expecting is an order of milliseconds. So that is where what makes it even more challenging and even more interesting. Uh, so that's all for today. Uh, so thank you. And I'm open to questions. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Vikram. Uh, it was a fascinating talk. Uh, and I think a lot of people don't realize the complexity of uh, just deploying such a system, right? Um, we all talk about um, neural networks and deep learning uh, having solved a lot of problems. Um, but beyond the neural network, uh, you know, like you were talking about uh, you know, the latency issue, uh, the fact that uh, there are models that are very good and better than you know a conglomerate of models like uh, that are using you know existing language models, but uh, the fact that they need the context uh, means that they can't automatically start translating. So these are you know fascinating things that we uh, as users of these systems uh, often don't think about. Uh, one of the questions that has been asked here is uh, how do you differentiate between users? Um, especially in, in uh, you know, households where you have children and, and adults uh, and, uh, you know, there's all sorts of parental control on certain uh, devices. Um, you know, how would you uh, be able to 
figure out the differences in users and make sure that uh, children through these speech interfaces don't get access to uh, uh, it's not easy. It's quite challenging. And the reason is because how do you know that the child is speaking versus the adult is speaking? Well, the ASR can be trained to, to recognize both. But the differentiation, right, that is an area of research. It is not so simple. And that is the reason why today there are a lot of group that happen. And typically, you would uh, it would not be easy to uh, I mean, there, there is, a, of course, a, a user detection. So there is a evolving, uh, I didn't talk about it today, but there is a, you know, even uh, you have, if you have a room and you have, like, let's say, office room and you have six people speaking and you want the system to transcribe and exactly say who spoke what. So there is speaker detection technology that is out there. Today, I didn't speak about that. So there is speaker detection, but it is still evolving. It is not perfect. But yes, there is there is there are techniques around detecting who spoke what. There's speaker detection technology in place. Um, what about uh, a deep uh, learning? You know, we talk about uh, the fact that there are now lots of uh, uh, techniques for creating deep fakes. So, um, you know, is there a concern here that, uh, you know, for example, uh, somebody could attack uh, these devices, uh, you know, by uh, using these deep fake uh, yes, yes. So spoofing, spoofing is another big area. And today right. I didn't mention that, but that's another big area and a lot of research happening. And uh, typically all these systems have to have some way of detecting whether it's a fake or not. Mm -hmm. And that is another area of uh, research. And I didn't mention today, but it is very important. Right. Uh, and, and, you know, one question that I have for a lot of uh, the speakers here is, you know, are, are we rushing with the AI because of the, uh, you know, the competition? Are we pushing in AI models that you know haven't had enough thought put into uh, you know these kinds of uh, negative uh, use cases? And are we kind of putting ourselves out there uh, uh, and uh, you know under threat now with uh, these technologies that have access to a lot of our personal information? And uh, you know um, because we want to get this technology out there and haven't really built these ring fencing around them to protect mm -hmm. us. Uh, is this a concern, do you think, or do you think? Uh, it is a concern. It is a concern. So that's the reason why we have user consent, you know. We're taking user consent at all stages. Uh -huh. uh, we may make sure, I mean, we don't want to invade users' privacy. We don't want the personal data. That is why wake up is very important. So right. wake up has to be tuned to perfection. We don't launch before until, until that happens, right? So we don't want the device to wake up because right now the device only listens to you when you wake up. But then again, you know, spoofing and those things. So as of now, as of now, the technology is not perfect. So when we give, when the system is out there, if anybody can say hi, we can wake up, right? Right. So, right. so spoofing is an area of a uh, lot of work is happening, and uh, um, you know, uh, I kind of partly agree with you that yes, uh, you know, the technology is not perfect, uh, but at the same time, you know, uh, what uh, if we don't have this? If we don't go through this, right, we'll never get there. So okay. we have to launch and experience some failures and learn from mistakes and, and move on, right? Mm. So that is where we are. And uh, I think that's that's how, that's all I can say at this point. Sure. Uh, so another question is, sir, if there is a scenario like there are two devices, one in the near field and the other in the far field, uh, we want to wake up the far field device, but the near field device wakes up. Uh, yes. What are the challenges in this scenario? Yes, so there are challenges there. So that's the reason why we need to understand the user's intention. And uh, users, uh, you know, prior, there's priority of which device to wake up in which case in this context, and uh, there's all those other kinds. So, I mean, if, if I have five Samsung devices, uh, for example, right? I mean, yes, yes. in some ways, it doesn't matter which one wakes up as long as when you follow up with a question, it that yeah. ambiguates that and then passes on the message by waking up uh, their colleague, right, in the house. I mean, would that uh, be in a one yeah, hour? but no, but no, but really it kind of does matter because you, you want to play some video. Let's say you are to, want to play something on your phone and instead starts playing something on the TV. It's not so good, right? Oh, oh no, no, I agree. But what I'm saying is the, the actual wake up as long as, so if the devices, do they communicate with each other? They do you? communicate. They do communicate. However, uh, in, when the user is saying uh, something, you know, it's, it's best for the, the intended okay. device to wake up. Right. Because it, they can all listen. They can all listen. And finally, the device, um, you know, that is intended, that, that device should do, to right. do the job. And when you, sometimes it can happen that two devices can actually end up uh, playing. So which device user, you know, wakes up and um, like when I say play, right? 
you want to say um, play game of thrones versus uh, play a movie right? right you can you have to figure out what the user is intending right yeah, and yeah. Uh, so maybe the asr may wake up the phone but game of thrones is a game it's just best played on my game station and my tv so right. uh it, you have to understand uh, that as well so it's 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 evolving and i wouldn't say it's perfect mm-hmm. but uh, i guess whatever. i guess it's it's kind of a problem that even humans haven't solved right you go into yes, a room yes. and say hi john and there are three johns there you Correct. get a response from all of them absolutely kind absolutely kind of an interesting piece that you're trying to solve that we haven't solved as, as yes 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 um thanks for that uh, another question uh, what are the mostly used approaches for contextual identification or recognition uh i didn't get the question actually contextual uh, identification the identification of context or recognizing the context i mean what are the approaches that are typically yeah so we uh, you know some kind of early early decoding is what we can do so for example we have to figure out it's a weather domain right even if the user has been speaking hmm. we have to figure out it's a weather domain or if it's a user is saying play we know that even the user hasn't finished speaking hasn't telling stop telling i finished speaking what you want to play so play a song by michael jackson right Right. user hasn't but user has just said play so it means that user is trying to play something is either it's a game or it's a it's a music or a movie or something right so we we can figure out that context mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so that's an example okay um so another question do do the speaker uh, detect um, okay so i'm trying to pass this question um uh, you mentioned fail okay so gender uh, identification i guess that's easier right i mean that's easier that's yeah. easier because we have a lot of data right so we can do that uh so another question can transfer learning be used for various dialects from one language yes it can be used it's another area of research where you know we have tried to use uh, for for example we have hindi but mm. we want to train uh, bhojpuri right so we can right. use transfer learning so right. there are because you already have a trained system and you can kind of just tweak a little bit some of the layers and you can try, you can use it so that transfer learning we have applied successfully even we have applied transfer learning successfully from hindi to english you know you won't believe it but it works okay. something yeah. worked there okay yeah. great um so the next question uh, uh, for instance banks are adopting speech recognition to verify customers can you tell us about fraud management in speech recognition systems i guess we've kind of touched upon yeah see it's uh, very difficult to use speech only so that's why you need some other traditional technologies such as you know fingerprinting or iris i don't think by speech itself we can do that so, right but we actually had a interesting uh, i mean we we had a talk by uh, colonel indrajit singh uh, who uh, has obviously retired from the army now and is working in in uh, speech um, uh, based out, in a company based out of gurgaon and mm-hmm. he was actually talking about how uh, you know their key product is about using speech as a signature right as a password mm-hmm. and, and securing mm-hmm. systems using that so i guess there is some work there you know yes uh, you yes. seem to reckon that it's actually fairly accurate uh, in correct um uh, so another question uh, for this to work our voice needs to be constantly monitored in order to detect the wake up word and the command after that yes yes uh, for, furthermore the device is connected to the internet too so where does it uh, where does that leave our privacy Uh, uh no so what happens is all of the monitoring that happens happens on the device there is no way to stream it the all systems that i know of today they cannot i mean streaming everything to server just doesn't make sense they, they cannot do it it's a huge amount of data right, right. and it just just doesn't make any sense right. and therefore you know all this monitoring happens on the device and it's very uh, low power and uh, you know uses low less cpu and there's a keyboard spotter kind of technology right. so that's that's how it really works today but all the data never goes to server hmm. only so, when you intend it it goes to server yeah so i mean the the actual uh, you you'd mentioned uh, you know a kind of a pre uh, post processing step before deployment of the model of actually reducing the size of the model so that we can actually execute it on um uh, you know a, a chip right uh, to reduce mm-hmm. the power usage and so on can you yes, give us a little bit of information about uh, you know what what kind of optimization are done um you know to uh well see uh, i would suggest you look at some references so let me go there right uh i'll just go to the slide for just a moment uh there is a lot of stuff. so if you just search about end to end asr right right so end to end asr there's a ton of references in there and uh 
you can talk about, look at all these techniques, right? There is uh, basically the classic listen at end spell paper. You can look at this uh, state of the art speech recognition with sequence music and right. all of these techniques are, all of these, uh, um, you know, there's a lot of literature out there. And this is a little, little old. If you look at the latest inter speech uh, papers, uh -huh. and uh, you know, there's a ton of uh, work on, on, on applying into NSR and compressing it. Um, there is a, there's really a lot happening. So I think uh, if you just Google for it, I'm sure you can find it. Sure, sure, sure. Great, thank you. Um, another one, now the system has its own pre-built voice, but uh, what if we can personalize the system's voice? Like a man wants the system to speak in his son's voice. Uh, how would that be done? Uh, yes, that is, that, that is possible. So that is more like the TTS. That is not speech recognition, but that is text-to-speech. Yeah. And yes, that is also possible. Uh, and we have tried to do it. And... Uh, it's a, it's kind of you know not perfect yet, but it is work in progress. And I mean, we have already launched it in uh, in India. You know, we tried to do take a, took a patient's voice, and uh, you know, one patient was their throat was getting affected, and um, they couldn't speak. Uh, so we, we kind of had some condition where after some time, you know, that their throat will not work. So we actually took that voice, and uh, we we were we were able to train Bixby with it, and. Uh, the text, to, you know, the text to speech to speak, uh, so that the children could hear the mother's voice, right? Even after the mother could stop speaking. So we tried that, and it worked. So wow. those things are possible, and uh, you know, that's more of the area of text to speech, which I didn't cover today. But it's it's doable. Uh, yeah. But it's I, I don't think it's there in the, such that we can do it for every case, everybody. So it's that level of uh, technology is not in production quality is not there, but in the lab it works. Yeah, but I mean that's actually very interesting, right? I mean, even yes. a, a social good application of you know where somebody loses their voice. Yes, a, yes. Or whatever. Absolutely. The Absolutely. ability to have that familiarity of voice uh, still being uh, you know uh, uh, delivered to people that you're speaking to is actually very correct. Correct. Love, love that idea. Correct. Um, a question um, in an enterprise setup: the browsers are blocked for voice, and even these, uh, even if these are open. Uh, there are always ports issues or other technical challenges. How to make this work in enterprise and at the same time uh, clear penetration test or vulnerability test, which is mandated by enterprises? Uh, you know, these are kind of operational challenges. Yeah, I don't think I'll be able to answer that question because huh. typically we are operating in the consumer space, not really the enterprise space. Right. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Um, Partho, uh, do you want to ask a question? You you, you mentioned uh, if yes, you can one. happy to. Unmute. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, so first of all, uh, Vikram sir, thank you for uh, this wonderful uh, presentation on this ASAR. And uh, so informative and uh, it's like a guidance to all of us. So my questions are very simple actually, that uh, what I collect from this is that uh, the state of the art is now the sequence to sequence model. Uh, yes. With attention and kind of thing. But Correct. Suppose, uh, suppose uh, we are working on uh, uh, one Indian language or any language where uh, which is not very common in nature. So mm -hmm. usually we don't get a lot of uh, label data. So yes. what would you suggest be a good starting point to create a custom ASR for that kind of language? So what I would suggest is you start small. Um, you know, make the ASR that kind of can take can work to some extent and collect the data, right? And you can use some transfer learning approaches to sort of make it uh, bootstrap it and sort of make it work, right? And as time goes along, uh, you will collect a lot of data. Now, that that huge amount of data, you can apply some teacher-student approaches. So today I didn't go into it, but you can you can check there are papers on applying teacher-student approaches. Uh, Amazon has tried that successfully. They've published a paper as well, and there are other approaches as well. So you can apply a lot of unsupervised and semi-supervised learning to sort of take that take existing data and use unlabeled uh, you know data and still use it so that is one possibility and the other possibility is uh, you know uh, taking some data and kind of uh, uh, you know labeling it and you need to spend some effort in in collecting more data and uh, sort of uh, as the system matures uh, you know continue continue to grow so we just need to wait for uh, uh, sufficient data to arrive yeah to yeah deliver a robust model oh, all right yeah correct oh. so Correct. Thank you, sir. And one more question. This will be my last question. That is, uh, um, sir, you are talking about that onboard, uh, so on device uh, ASR. Right? Yes. So, uh, can you comment on the um, a feasible size of the model? I mean, the deep learning model itself. So yeah, yeah. So, typically, these models are, you know, um, 
typically what we have seen few hundred mil, um, um, uh, millibytes is the, what the model size is. Few hundred. So, okay. Uh, so that we can embed that in a firmware or a yeah, yeah. That from that. Correct, correct, correct. All right. Thank you. Thanks again for this beautiful speech. I'm sure if you Google the papers, right, you'll find a lot of a uh, lot of information about this thing. So there is a ton of research out there, and uh, on end-to-end -end SRs, and I'm sure all these data details will also be there. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thanks, thanks, Pato. Uh, uh, Vikram, one one last question. I uh, we are coming up to to the hour, but uh, just sneak in one more. Um, so the question is around uh, detecting um, distress. Right, so uh, you know, has some thought been put into the fact that you know, if Bixby picks up a distressed voice, um, you know, uh, is there a call emergency number kind of uh, feature right now in there, or um, you know, what are the what are the issues that a business would have to think about before they take on such a a task? Yeah, that 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 is an ambitious target because it has to work properly, right? Uh, and uh, there it is doable, but I I mean, right now we don't. Uh, it's not. Uh, it's kind of something which is a little challenging because it has to work in every case, right? Right. And detecting right. this stress has to be there and uh, you can do it in extreme cases where you you know for sure it's stress, but then again, it should work. And if you launch a system like this, it should work properly. So there are, it's not so simple. Yeah. Right, right. And I guess there Physical are issues there also, right? I mean, there is the technical issues where of course a lot of work has been done on identifying emotion from yes. speech. Uh, yes. But then, of course, the on the business side, there are legal concerns and all. Yeah, legal things. concerns, correct. correct. Right, right. Okay, great. Well, Vikram, thank you so much. This has been a fascinating talk, um, and I, I thank you so much for giving all these references because, uh, as these uh, students, at least in in um, the both embark on on trying out some of the speech projects that we have, uh, uh, you know, put forward to them as passion projects. I think sure. this is the essentially, uh, you know, essential kind of uh, help. Uh, that they would require. Yes. So thank you for yes. that. And thank you for taking out the time and, uh, you know, uh, spending this, this hour with us. I hope we can uh, entice you to come back and talk to us some other time too. And, uh, you know, we would just love to, uh, even from your experience, having worked in this uh, area for so many years, if you could even, uh, you know, ping me with some ideas that you think would be fun, uh, you know, exercises for students to, to work on in the speech domain, I'd love to hear. Uh, sure, I can ping you that. Uh, in fact, we have been trying to do that in some of the universities. You know, we have uh, we have projects wherein um, we are growing our ecosystem in terms of, you know, not just research, but also working on actual technology. Right. And we have a PRISM, um, which was recently announced in the news as well. So we have uh, that uh, program wherein we have tie-ups with several uh, universities. So we can see uh, if we can possibly extend it to you as well. Typically, we are working with universities. Um, but sure. With, so, so on that uh, note, but we can I, talk, we can discuss separately. But nevertheless, we have uh, many exercises, and you know, to start with, you can you can look at the Kaldi framework. So, Kaldi is a kind of open source uh, speech, uh, you know, processing and speech recognition framework. Mm -hmm. So, K A L D I, Kaldi. Okay. So you can start there, and um, you can experiment. And there are various versions of Kaldi, and so on. It's very popular. Right. And, and of course, there are some others. So, but right. and, and we can come up with some set of uh, specific exercises, you know, for which would be good, uh, good as uh, assignments for us. Yeah, no, brilliant. So, I mean, as you know, uh, you know, you're part of the initiative in Iser Mohali also. Uh, yes, you know, yes. And um, I've just recently also taken on uh, the uh, directorship of the computer science department at Mujal University. So, uh, you know, if, if it's a university tie up you're looking for, we've got that in our hat too, or in our turban, as they say. So, yeah, so yeah. Forward yeah. to kind of engaging with you further. Sure, and, uh, sure, definitely. Thank you so much. We'll be for pleased to have a wonderful speech. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Bye.